What's up, River Point? What's up, West End? What's up to everybody? Mo City, all my people over there. We have been doing a fun collection of talks over the past few weeks called Not Going Back. There are some things that we're all looking forward to coming back and being normal again. But then there are some things, some habits, some ways of living that maybe we shouldn't return to that should create a new normal for us. The core verse for this collection of talks is found in Ephesians. It says this, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Right now, we have an opportunity in this season of our lives to do something we've never seen before. Right now is the perfect opportunity to change. I want to begin in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to talk about what we're going to not go back to, it says this in verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Today, I want to talk to you about not going back to being divided. Not going back to being divided. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my youngest son, and he has just captured my heart. He could ask for absolutely anything in the world, and if his mother said, no, he can't have it, I would figure out a way to get it to him. In fact, this is a picture of my whole family, and this is what I want you to know about them, okay? They are easy to love. It's not very difficult for me to love my wife. It's not very difficult for me to love my kids because, well, they're my family and I love them. Not because I have to. Like, I actually like them, love them. What I know about you and me is this. It's actually pretty easy to love people who love us back. It's similarly easy to like people who like us. However, the people who are the most difficult to love are the people who don't look like, talk like, think like, believe like, spend money like, live life like, or vote like us. You know, pre-COVID-19 era, I think we lived in a society where we could feel the division daily on social media or at work. And it mostly centered around causes, campaigns, especially politics. And everyone has their own camp or had their own camp, their own kind, their own people, and for some, their own soapbox. If you're for what I'm for, then I can be for you. But if you don't care about what I care about, then I can actually feel like I have the right to write you off. But then a pandemic hits. And we all have the same thing that's keeping us up at night. The NBA, Disney, and retailer shut their doors. And all of a sudden, we all have the same threat to our peace. And it's interesting that a pandemic allowed our differences in who we will or won't vote for in November to fade to the distance. And what we've done instead is just love each other and check on each other without pre-qualifying anyone. It's really amazing what matters to us the most when we're hurting. Jesus had a conversation with a lawyer in Luke chapter 10 that I think gives us a great example of how we should deal with people who, might, who we might view as being opposite on the opposite side of us that might not think like us. And, and I think it, it's pretty profound and it's found in uh, Luke chapter 10. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall we do? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Love God, love people. A lot of Christ followers have heard that and get that on a basic level. But this lawyer took it to another level. He says, but desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
This sentence is portrayed as though the lawyer is asking, if the requirement is to love God and love people, then our response should be, what people? I mean, if we're taking our cues from Jesus, this is a really great question because it's going, okay, um, how do you define neighbor? Left to ourselves, we will often play our own referee of deciding who is deserving of our love and who is not. We'll play the role. We'll say, well, they, they, they deserve it and this one doesn't. And this lawyer, his keeping of the second commandment that Jesus gives him about his neighbor, not just loving God, love people, but loving his neighbor, really depended on how Jesus defined who his neighbor was. If Jesus' definition of neighbor were to include his family, friends, lawyer, buddies, then perhaps this man would have said, yeah, I've actually fulfilled the law. The Jews in Jesus' day did believe that you had to love your neighbor. They had no problem being kind to their own kind. But they were also taught that, in fact, it was your duty before God to hate your enemy. We even see Jesus recognize this notion in the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 43, he says, you have heard that it was said. Jesus is going, you heard this. You know that this was taught. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It all really depends on how a person differentiates between who their neighbor is and who their enemy is. Jesus chooses to answer this lawyer's neighbor question with a story. And here's how that story goes. It says in verse 30, Jesus replied, man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. As we look at this text, one of the first things we need to recognize is the road that Jesus is talking about here is not a fictional road. In fact, this is a very specific road. The lawyer would have actually been very familiar with. This is a road that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho, and it was notorious for crime and muggings. This road today is incredibly windy, having lots of twists and turns where it would be easy for robbers to have a positional advantage to surprise attack their victims. The lawyer would not have been shocked that Jesus would start off his story on this particular road. In the story, a man has been stripped, beaten, and left almost dead on the side of the road. Jesus then introduces two more characters, a priest and a Levite. Both of these men represent religious officials who see their Jewish brother in obvious need of their help. But in Jesus' story, Neither of them do anything. They both passed by on the other side. We can assume that they would have had logical excuses as to why they could not rescue the man in the moment. Perhaps they thought the road was too dangerous for them to stop and lend a helping hand. Maybe the guy was just pretending that he was, he was pretending and he was actually a decoy. The reality is we all come to face We all come face to face with needs that we often will find excuse ourselves from meeting. We will do our best to help someone in need as long as it doesn't find it as as an inconvenience to our schedule. I mean, how many times have we driven past a car wreck on the side of the highway and assumed someone else has already called 911? We use the assumption that the medical professionals have the situation under control and therefore conclude there is no need for us to help. But how do we actually know the situation is already taken care of if we never pull over? Jesus then introduces another character in this narrative. When the lawyer heard about the priest, 
and the Levite. He probably expected Jesus to end the story by saying, a common Jewish man came as the hero of the story to rescue the man left for dead. Perhaps this would be another way Jesus would make a comparison between the religious elite and the commoners. Jesus often shed light on corruption of religious leaders and you know a lot of stories that he did did that. But what Jesus did was so uncanny because he didn't in introduce a common man. He introduced an enemy. Jesus threw in a major plot twist by bringing in a Samaritan. A Samaritan. What we must understand about this culture and time in this story is that Jews and Samaritans despised one another, both racially and religiously. Trust me, they did not vote for the same person. They were not on the same side of the track. Like they hated they, their, their rivalry went back hundreds and centuries. The, the war between their people based on cultural norms, the Samaritan would have had every reason to hate this Jewish man and keep on moving in Jesus' story. Historians show us that some rabbis actually taught that Jews were forbidden to help a Gentile woman who was in distress giving birth. Because if they succeeded, all they would have accomplished was to bring one more Gentile into the world. They often thought that Samaritans were worse than other Gentiles. It is plausible that the Samaritan in this story would walk by and actually rejoice seeing the Jewish man in agony. But Jesus tells the, tells the lawyer and us that the Samaritan had something for this man he should not have had. Compassion. Love and compassion he had the opposite reaction of what would have been considered normal. The man left for dead never asked for help, but the Samaritan did not need a request to respond. The Samaritan was the first responder. He was the first aid. In one of his last messages at the end of the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King stated the following regarding this text. He said, the first question the priest asked, the first question the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? The wine the Samaritan had in this story containing alcohol would have helped sanitize this man's wounds. The oil would have helped ease his pain. Both of these remedies would have been norm, a normal response for a man's external medical needs. But to then put, uh, to put this man on his own animal, this would have meant that the Samaritan himself would have been forced to walk. This is a man whose schedule in life has been inconvenienced completely. Not only was his life inconvenienced, but Jesus also tells us he took out some money and gave it to the innkeeper where he brought the man to stay. The Samaritan's love for this man has now impacted his wallet. Biblical scholars tell us that two denarii, as Jesus described, would have provided for the man's needs at the end for at least two to three weeks. He then tells the innkeeper, if the man's bills exceed what he already provided, he would cover the extra costs when he returned. This also shows us this Samaritan not only carried out a good deed for one day, but intended on seeing how the man left for dead might recover. He exemplified extraordinary and sacrificial love for a man he should have hated. Jesus concluded his lesson for the lawyer with this text. He says in verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Jesus paints a picture of a person 
who proved to be a neighbor to someone who lived outside of their neighborhood. In fact, Jesus paints a picture of a man who had an opportunity to help a stranger he had a lot of reasons to despise. Jesus' conclusion in his explanation of who our neighbor is has less to do with our zip codes and more to do with our comfort zones. Perhaps our neighbors not only include the people we like the most, share common interests with, or those who live in our neighborhood, perhaps our neighbors are the people who don't look like, live like, vote like, act like, think like, believe like, or see the world like we do. Can you imagine a world? What if we stop playing the referee of who deserves our sacrificial love and who will never be worthy of it? What if we began living with the notion that whoever we come into contact with, wherever we come into contact with them, is a candidate for the grace and love shown to us by Heavenly Father? Jesus was focusing the microscope on the definition of who our neighbor is because he wanted to shed some light on the person we would want to be our neighbor the least. By pointing this out, Jesus is inviting us to push past our differences and live life like a good neighbor. Something powerful happens in our lives when they and them over there become we and us. Jesus doesn't need us to, to tell us to love people we already love. We don't need Jesus to be kind to our kind. He invites us outside of that way of living to show us what his love truly looks like. We have found ourselves being willing to go outside of our comfort zone in a crisis. But I pray that we never go back to getting comfortable. Uh, it, it's been so interesting uh, during this pandemic is uh, me, and my, me and my family, we've been going on walks around the neighborhood. I'm not an outdoorsman. Like, I don't even like going to my mailbox, okay? Like, I love getting in my car, going out the garage and going to wherever I need to go. And it's been so cool going on walks, you know, at least every other day with my family. And the weird part is, is all of our neighbors are out doing the same thing. And it's so weird. Like we're like meeting our neighbors now, like meeting, meeting them and like waving at them from across the way. And it's like, it's so interesting getting to know people in the neighborhood. We're going a little bit slower. And every now and then we're pulling over on the side of the road and just talking to them from six feet away. Normally we wouldn't do that. Normally, we'd be in a hurry. Normally, we wouldn't. We, we would find many reasons to be not as inclusive, not as neighborly. It's been amazing to watch people lay down their cause, to, to lay down the thing that used to matter the most of them. And then everyone got, man, it. We're, we're all on pandemic notice and when are things going to open back up and when can I go get my nails done and when can I go get a haircut and when can I golf again? When can I, when can I, when can I, when can I? And, and we all have the same thing. I was on the, on the phone with my best friend last night and I said, normally people go through rough seasons and we kind of take turns. Like I might have a, a bad April and you might have a bad May, but it's like, no, we, we're all sharing this season together. And right now, I think we're all in a Samaritan-like position to not qualify how we help people or who we help. It's just like, you know what? No, we, we would give to a COVID-19 fund. We give to the church. We say, you know what? We, we want to make a difference. It doesn't matter who we're making a difference for. If someone is hurting because, they're, because we feel like we have this invisible enemy and it's attacking all of us. So I got your back and you got my back and we're not, we're just not as divided as we normally are. And here's what my hope and prayer is, is that, is that we don't return to our camps and silos when this is all over. My hope and prayer is that we continue to extend grace and a helping hand to our neighbors. And the question I, I want you to have in a, in a small group over the phone with your friends or maybe even as a family is, are there some needs in, in your corner of the world that you could help with and be like the Samaritan that just says, you know what, I'm, 
Somebody's, somebody's hurting. I, I got you. Number two, who is the hardest person or type of person in your world to love on a regular basis? And maybe you've given them a little bit of extra grace. I've been saying that with my wife a lot lately. She goes, we need to talk to this person about this. Like, ah, we're going to give them pandemic grace because we're all, we're all going through something. So number three, given Jesus' story, who do you think your neighbor is? Who do you think, who would you say, oh, this, this is the person? And it might be the person you would never want to live next to, but that might be the very person that this message is drawing you towards to say, you know what, man, maybe we could send them something. Maybe we could send a note. Maybe we could look out for them. I can only imagine what's going to happen to us when things go back to normal and some things don't go back to normal. Maybe before this, there were people that were on the opposite side of so many issues from you. I can only imagine what your life would look like, what my life would look like if we just said, you know what? We're unified more than ever before right now. We're, we're locking arms to go, man, are, are you healthy? Are you good? Are you safe? I pray that that stays. May we not go back to not checking in on one another. May we not go back to to, to going above and beyond for our neighbors. May we be people that pull over when we need to, that we would slow down long enough to see the needs in our world to say, you know what, Lord, is there something that I can do for someone else? And regardless of their belief system, regardless of their stance on a litany of issues, might I extend so much grace and so much love to someone that may not think or live like me. God, I thank you so much for each and every person watching this message. God, I pray that you would help us not go back to being divided. May we live unified. May we live like the Samaritan and look out for the good of those in our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.